Well, welcome to the webinar. Uh, this is our monthly webinar. We're doing it on liver congestion. And what does it mean? How to detect it? And what do we do about it? Uh, I really wanted to cover this because I think this is one of those things uh, in functional, in any kind of functional work, systems biology, functional medicine, chiropractic, internist work, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's one of the things, those things we talk about a lot. But, uh, you know, I think it's good to really define it and start thinking about it in those terms because uh, I know Dr. Brandon Lundell, who I think is terrific. He's brilliant and he does a lot of great things. You ever get a chance to listen to him speak somewhere, you definitely want to do that. But anyway, he had a saying, he said, good doctors know what to do and great doctors know why. So uh, it's not enough just to simply, oh, you have liver congestion. Let's do this, let's do that. It's not about a protocol, but it's really about understanding a liver physiology and what's going on. So let's just jump right into this. So this is the liver. And uh, as we said, there's four lobes to the liver. There's actually eight lobes when you split it out into all the different places. And I want to talk a little bit about, please don't snooze on me here because this is really important uh, stuff. Basically, these are the four lobes. You can see at the left lobe, right lobe, cauda, which is down, you know, bottom round in the quadrate. Um, but let's go through a few facts about the liver. As I said, good doctors know what to do great doctors know why and it's important to understand when we say this word liver congestion it's important to understand really what we're talking about first just a few factoids if you will the the liver weighs three pounds it performs hundreds of functions that are necessary for us to stay alive I, other than the brain it's kind of a close tie there but other than the brain it is arguably the most important organ in the body it's the largest gland of the body circuit largest only to the skin, the skin is larger and heavier, right? So uh, performs many essential functions, glycogen storage, metabolism, uh, decomposition of red blood cells, plasma protein sense, hormone production, and uh, getting rid of hormones, immunity, detoxification, all these different things, vital organs without, which the tissues could uh, would quickly die with a lack of energy and nutrients. So the, uh, the liver's doing a whole lot of things here. If you look at the liver uh, poison control center, it must deal with all foreign material to consist of bacteria, viruses, fungi, mold, parasites, protozoa, toxins, metals, uh, drugs. And just think about in our society today, uh, the level of toxicity that's in our environment. Our liver has to take care of this. Whether we touch something with our skin, whether we smell it, just to give an example, if you walk through a, a perfume aisle and uh, you immediately get a headache or you have problems, uh, when you go through a perfume aisle, this, this means the liver is not functioning as well as it's not clearing those things out uh, properly. If you smell gasoline and uh, all of a sudden you get a headache, well, that's because your liver is having problems with detoxification pathways. So a uh, fire station is responsible to handle all the inflammation in the body uh, process, all the inflammation. Inflammation along with oxygen-free radicalization are the two top uh, two common causes of the attack of the human body. So the liver has a lot to do with the inflammatory process. Fuel station. This is where you metabolize and not only your glucose, but you metabolize your fats, you metabolize your proteins, pretty much everything goes through there. And then of course, it's the hormone transaction center. This is a responsible process, 85% of 600 hormones in the human body. So as we said, it detoxifies the blood, production of clotting factors, metabolizes toxins, hormones, medications, nutrients, uh, pro uh, processed and waste products, the so hemoglobin, other things, storing of vitamins and fats, vitamin uh, A, vitamin E, vitamin A, whoops, vitamin A, E, K, D. These are all stored in the liver as well as B12. So these are stored in the liver. So if you have a congested liver, then this is not uh, perhaps going as well. Of course, you're going to store cholesterol by all these other things, production of glucose. All right. So let's get down into it. So the, the hepatocytes, which are the liver cell, liver cells and hepatocyte. It's the main cell in the liver. There's other cells that are players. We're going to talk about those, but they are tasked with many important metabolic jobs to support the cells of the body. So uh, let's just look at this. First, I want to draw, see if I can draw a picture here. Here's the liver right here. And here is the gallbladder. And here is the, um, the duct. Comes out like this. And up here is the stomach. Now, Dr. Annette, can you see that picture okay? Just want to make sure we can see the picture okay. 
Yep, it's nice and big. Okay, very good. That's what I like. Okay, so of course here is the liver. Uh, here is the gallbladder. Here's the pancreas and there's the stomach. All right, so just as a basic function, all the blood that goes to the GI tract, all the blood that goes to the internal organs here, when they leave those internal organs, they go to the liver and then the liver takes it up through the hepatic vein up into the inferior vena cava into the heart. And I'm gonna draw that diagram in just a moment. But first, let's look at this. When we eat food, it mixes with hydrochloric acid. And it's very important that we chew our food and then we mix it with hydrochloric acid. We've done webinars on that because right down here is where all the action happens. So what happens is this food that's been mixed with the hydrochloric acid hits into the top part of the duodenum, the top part of the small intestine, and it, it causes a dramatic drop in the pH. When you drop the pH, that activates the pancreas to release digestive enzymes. What are digestive enzymes doing? They're helping you break down and get the sugar ready to get into the liver. They break down the proteins, the polypeptides. The proteins are already beginning the process of getting broke down the HCL, but they get down to the individual amino acids with the digestive enzymes. And then uh, fat can't cross this wall. Fat cannot cross this wall. So we make bile. Bile is in the gallbladder. It's released and uh, it helps you absorb the fat. And just as a, just a little factoid here, so here is uh, bile. Bile is a center of fat and it has water droplets on the outside and it looks like that. Well, then you eat fat and that fat that you eat absorbs into that. And then because this is water on the outside, it can go through that wall and get into the portal vein. Now, which takes me to the point I really wanted to make with this whole, uh, this whole scenario, and that's this. Once the food is ready, and it gets ready to different places, it's not just one place, but I'm just simplifying this, it goes through this big portal vein. The big portal vein goes into the liver, and then the liver processes it. And I'm gonna draw something and make this very simplistic, and then we're gonna get more complex. First, let's start with the simple. And, and I'm going to draw just, here we go. I'm drawing five liver cells. You have millions upon millions upon millions. But the, the, the food that's been broken down, like the amino acids, the fats, the, the, uh, the sugar, that's all been broken down. And it is going to actually transport and come through here, through the portal vein. And it's going to get into here into the liver. Now, the liver cells, the hepatocytes, are gonna do some very basic things. They're going to take stuff out of that food, process, and then put stuff back into that, out into the blood, and then it's gonna go up into the heart through the inferior vena cava, and then the heart's gonna send it out for circulation. So that's pretty much how you get food from the table into your blood. It goes, you chew, it goes in the stomach, it goes down here. You have these three main players, the pancreas, the HCL, the, the, the bile flow that gets it prepared, and then you get it delivered, then the liver processes. So that's basically what happens. So when we have what we call a liver congestion, basically, we have a liver that's not doing that well. And so let's let's get into this and talk about, about this more specifically. I got to tell you, I'm a little bit of a geek when it comes to uh, getting into uh, like hepatic uh, physiology. So, so please just go with me here. I'm going to get very clinical on this, but I want to make sure that we get these basic components down. So when we have, there's a compilation of cells. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't even want to read this. I want to just get to the pictures, right? We like pictures. All right. So when we look at this right here, um, this there's, there's hexagonal. This is what this is. Hexagonal, right? Um, so, so that means that we have six of these things, right, hexagon, and what that is, is this is a round circle. You're, you're only seeing two of these here, like that's one and that's two right there, but that this whole circle is made, uh, uh, made up of a hexagon, and here's the basic function and how it works. You remember I just showed you the picture, or drew a picture of the portal vein, right? So what's going to happen is 
uh, food comes into the portal vein. You know, the you break the breakdown of the fats, the pro, the amino acid, and the sugars, and the other stuff that comes to the food is going to get come into uh, this section right here into the portal vein. Let me get a different color because that's that's not quite um, doesn't show up quite as well. So so it comes in here like this, and then it comes into this portal vein. And then what it's going to do is it's going to go through this process right here. It's going to this called sinusoids. These are called san, sinusoids. Now keep in mind this is an important uh, concept that as the blood is coming through the portal vein, it's only moving at about nine millimeter pressure is only about nine millimeters mercury pressure. There's only about nine millimeters mercury pressure. So if you think about it. You know, blood pressure is 120 over 80, you know, 110 over 70. So nine millimeters of, of mercury is not a lot of pressure. So it's kind of just floating through there. So it goes through these sinusoids, right? So when it goes through these sinusoids, it, here are this right here, these guys right here are, are hepatocytes. These guys right here are the hepatocytes. The hepatocytes are going to pull uh, uh, the proteins, the sugars, and the fats out of the blood and going to process it. And then also it's going to take stuff and put it back into the blood. And then this is going to flow through here and it's going to go to the central vein. The central vein is where you're collecting pretty much everything from all the sinusoids from just one of these units. This is called a unit, right? This is the hexagonal functional unit. And guess what? You have about 50 to 500, 50 to, to 100,000 of these individual lobules. So you, and these, each one of these lobules, each functional units, I should say, lobules are 0.8 to two millimeters in diameter. So they're not real big, but you have, you know, like I said, 50,000 to 100,000 of these, right? So each lobule, lobule consists of a central vein surrounded by these six hepatic portal veins. And this is what we're talking about right here. Okay, so now, so once that stuff gets into the processed uh, blood, gets into the central vein, then what it does is it goes to the hepatic vein, then the hepatic vein goes into the inferior vena cava, and that goes up into the heart, the right side of the heart, and then processed through the lungs and so on and so forth into circulation. So that's pretty much how we roll through here. So let's look a little closer at a few more things. In addition to the hepatic cells, the venous sinusoids, so that's what we're talking about, those sinusoids, that's what's, you know, that's, that's that column that's going right through there, and the hepatocytes are, are doing the processing. So the venous sinusoids are lined by two other types of cells. There are things called sinusoidal, sinusoidal, I should say. Um, uh, whoops, I got to get the wrong thing. Endothelial cells and has generally been thought to promote regenerative regeneration of the liver. So, and I'm going to show you a picture of this in a moment. Along with stem cells and progenitor cells, which have the capacity to differentiate and mature cell types, might be responsible for stimulating liver degen or re regeneration. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you've heard this before. I heard a story one time, it's kind of a, a, dra a, dramatic, a dramatic story, but this guy was cutting wood professionally and they had big saws and saw went down, bucked on him and went down and went right down through there and actually cut off two thirds of his liver. The guy survived and he only had one third of his liver left, and, but he survived and the liver literally grew back to its normal uh, form and shape. So the liver is the one organ that really has the ability to regenerate massively. We have to have this ability or we would not survive this environment. So we also have something called, but anyway, that these endothelial cells are uh, largely responsible for that regeneration uh, characteristic. Okay, so we also have large cuffer cells. These are the macrophages in the liver, macrophage. Remember, monocytes float around in the blood. When they get to an organ or a gland or wherever they're going to live, they pretty much stay there and they become whatever they are in that name, whatever it is. If you're in the brain, you're a microglial cell. If you're in the liver, you're, you're a cuffer cell. So it's a part of the reticular endothelial system. Remember, 
the reticular endothelial system starts in the spleen and it goes, let me see if I got a different pin. My pin's not working very good. It starts in the spleen and it's it goes all the way to the liver and it cleans up you know, uh, uh, frayed red blood cells that are red blood cells that have frayed membranes and so forth. It does all those different things, but it also goes after bacteria, viruses, um, fungi, you know, in it, parasites, whatever. It's going to go after those things as well. Anything that's not supposed to be in there, those cuffer cells are going to eat it up, right? So they're a type of macrophage. So we look at this right here. Um, let's Let's take this one step further right here. I want to go back. To, I want to go on this one. Just one step further. Let's look at this. Now, let's look at these green things. You see these green things right here? What those green things are is they are actually pulling away from what's going through those sinusoids, and they're pulling away and making bile. They're making bile. See, this is all, you know, the, the, the liver cell has to process the liver cell has to take, the hepatocyte has to take cholesterol and it has to take bilirubin and it's also going to take um, hormones that you're uh, discarding, gone through phase one and phase, you know, phase two detox, they're in phase two detoxification, they're conjugated, you're going to put that in there, toxins you get from the environment, whatever, you and some salt, you put that in, that makes some bile, that bile is actually going to uh, that bile is going to flow down into these into these little tributaries. Let me see if I can get a better pin here. Into these tributaries here and go into all these little green things. These green things are all collectively going to come together to make a a, a, a bladder a gallbladder duct, a, a yeah hepatic duct, and then it's going to go into and go into uh, the gallbladder. So all these little tributaries are, are, are going in and feeding the gallbladder. So tremendous amount of things that are happening here. Hepatocytes, cuboidal, epithelial uh, cells that line the sinusoids, perform most of the liver functions of uh, metabolism, storage, digestion, bile production. I was just talking about bile production. Um, and I'll just give you a little snippet here. So if you have a hormone, if you have a hormone, let's say you have um, estrogen, let's say you have estrogen, and uh, estrogen, once you use it and it comes off the receptor, it's fat soluble, so you have to get rid of it. You cannot get rid of anything in your body that's fat soluble, so it has to go to the liver. Once it goes to the liver, the liver is going to convert it into a water metabolite. Now we think water metabolite, it must be good, but actually these, these metabolites can be nasty and bad. But what's supposed to happen in phase two of the liver detoxification, you conjugate it or, 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 or connect it to something like glutathione, um, uh, sulfur, methionine, you know, some of these products, you're going you're gonna to bind it to it and then you're going to get it out. Well, through the bile is one of the ways that we get some of these things out. So when you make bile in the hepatocyte, you're taking bilirubin cholesterol and you're putting these toxins and put it together in salts, and that's what's making up your bile. So there's just a lot of uh, tremendous things that are happening. I kind of really like this picture a lot. So here's our portal vein down here. And then we're going through the sinusoids here. You see the sinusoids right there? And if you look on here, you will see these little things with fingers on them. Guess what those guys are? These guys are the cuffer cells. We're going to make sure bacteria is not getting in to the central vein, to getting the heart circulation. It's going to make sure viruses, you know, fungi. It's going to make sure uh, toxins and different things. You know, that benzene you just smelled in your gas from, you know, you're too close to the gas or whatever. The cuffer cells are the last line of defense before you get into the circulation because once it gets in the central vein, it's going to go right up the hepatic vein, then it's going to go right into the inferior vena cava, inferior vena cava, into the heart, into circulation. So this, these guys, man, they are so important because they are really our last line of defense. Now watch this. This is really, like I said, I geek out on this stuff a little bit, but the hepatocytes are processing things, but you know what they're also doing? They're doing fat metabolism and they're making bile and they're, they're shunting the bile 
right into this green part right there, and that is going to go through the bile and part make part of the bile up. Isn't that awesome? Okay, so here are endothelial cells here. Uh, let's move on. Okay, millions of spaces of discs. Um, okay, so let's get on to some more clinical stuff. I wanted to give you an outlay of how that works. To me, I can spend a lot of time going over this. Matter of fact, I think module 10 or 11, I go through, um, I go through liver path physiology and I spend at least eight hours on all this stuff. And we really drill down. It's a lot of fun. So, but anyway, it, you know, today I can only go through so much. There's just so much I can do in an hour's period of time. So if you walk away from this and say, well, you did say this about this. Well, guess what? There's a thousand things that we have to put it all together. I'm trying to make this as clinical as we can make it. Now, let's get clinical, right? Okay, so there are four diagnostic terms that we need to be really familiar with. And these are not uh, functional terms. These are terms these are regular standard traditional medicine diagnostic terms okay pass uh, so so let me say this when we say liver congestion it's a functional term not a pathological term it's a functional term and i'm going to explain it here okay so we have four diagnostic terms to deal with first we have passive hepatic congestion we have steatosis we have non-alcoholic steato steato uh, hepatitis and we have cirrhosis so when we have passive hepatic congestion, that's the one that's kind of more related to when it's functional to liver congestion. Steatosis is fatty liver and something called NASH. This is actually called NASH. I didn't write it out like that, but you'll see it as NASH, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. That's when you have fatty liver with oxidative stress and inflammation. And then cirrhosis is where you there's so much damage in the liver that you start causing fibrosis, scar tissue, and so on and so forth. And if you can imagine looking at what we just went through, all those hepatocytes, if you start having scarring in there, can you imagine how hard it would be to actually uh, have normal processing in your liver? So let's talk a little bit about passive hepatic congestion first, okay? So let's talk about the medical traditional diagnosis, and then let me show you what's happening from a functional st a standpoint. All right, so passive hepatic congestion. The most common cause is congestive heart failure, tricuspid insufficiency, constricted pericarditis. It's something in this line. And let me show you why. What happened in my picture? Oh, here we go. Let me go here. So the reason why is this. Let's let's draw a heart up here. The thing's not working, so I'm gonna have to do all this with my finger, which is just fine because I'm not a complainer. All right, here we go. Here we go. All right, so this is going to be the portal vein. Okay, that's the portal vein, and we you know we we talked about the physiology. It's going to wind in the central vein. Central vein is going to the hepatic vein, and then we're going to come up to what is called the inferior vena cava, okay? This is the superior coming from the brain, uh, coming from the bottom of the body, you have inferior vena cava, okay? So blood goes into the right side of the heart, into the atrium, the atrium through the tricuspid valve, pumps it into the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps it into the lungs, and this is where we exit the Oxid, uh, the carbon dioxide, and then we enter in oxygen. Once we get the oxygenated blood, it goes back into the left side of the heart through the mitral valve, and then we have the left ventricle, which pushes it out to the body. Very quick cardiac physiology there, but that's pretty much the, the blood flow. Now, watch this. If you have, let's give an example. If you have something called core pulmonale, which is right-sided heart failure that's coming because of some kind of lung difficulty. Maybe you have uh, chronic bronchitis, or maybe you have emphysema. You have something that's caused your lungs to have pressure on them. So when it comes time to actually uh, push blood into the uh, lungs from the right side of the heart, you get that resistance. And when you get that resistance, it causes 
the it causes the fluid to back up and when that fluid blacks up it can back up and go all the way in the liver and actually congest the liver because the liver can't deal with that fluid because there's no outlet for it there's a plumbing problem now somebody just an example somebody could have high blood pressure for a long period of time that they're not taken care of well what happens with that then the left ventricle, because of the high blood pressure, is having to push so hard that it's pushing blood out into the system so hard that you get uh, you get a hypertrophy of that, you know, the, a bigger left ventricle muscle. Well, that causes a backup in the lungs, makes it harder for the lungs to get it in there, and then that's going to cause pressure there, and that can cause that. And another thing they noticed here, or they noted here, is tricuspid valve problem. If you can't open it well, there's going to be a backup. Anything that doesn't allow that normal circulation can cause a backup and becomes the most common cause of what's called passive hepatic congestion. Okay, so this is kind of what it would look like if you saw it. Uh, you know, it's all blown up, the liver's bigger, and so on and so forth. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the functional side of this. So right here is the portal vein, right? There's the portal vein. And let me get a different color so we can illustrate it perhaps a little better. So here's our portal vein, right? So as we're moving through the sinusoids right here, when we have an overabundance of inflammation, we have oxidative stress, uh, we have a lot of detoxification things that we're dealing with, then this fluid can actually congest as it's coming through the uh, sinusoids. And as it does that, you're going to have a congested liver because you simply cannot process things as efficiently. Things are not getting into the hepatocytes as well. The hepatocytes are not able to deal with as well. As a matter of fact, even the health of the hepatocytes begin to suffer because hepatocytes need this action all the time. So when you start getting congestion of that fluid as it's going through here, and the most common causes of this are going to be things like dealing with too many toxins, more toxins your body's able to deal with, inflammatory process, oxidative stress, free radicals, you know, these kind of things become overwhelming to the liver. And that's one of the reasons why liver congestion has become such a big item that we have to deal with clinically as a chiropractic internist, because it's we're, we're seeing more toxins in our environment. We're seeing more of this going on, not less of this. And so people are, are more susceptible to having liver congestion. So from the functional standpoint, those are that's what's going on. So basically, what are we going to do about this? Well, one thing, we got to reduce toxins. We've got to improve detoxification pathways. We have to reduce inflammation, reduce oxidative stress, get good circulation. I'm going to go through a whole list of things in just a little bit, but I'm just showing you some exercise your body, move the body, improve your blood supply, make sure your digestion's good, make sure your bile flow is good. All these different things are important if we're going to reduce congestion because guess what there's another thing that can cause this functional type of liver congestion and that's this when you have sluggish bile flow when you have sluggish bile flow it's actually going to cause some backflow this way instead of going that way you're going to cause black flow this way and that can cause congestion because it'll leak out and cause problems there for the hepatocytes now keep in mind if you have insulin resistance, if you have low functioning thyroid, if you have high estrogen relative to your progesterone, these are all things that can slow that bile flow down or your ability to make good bile flow. Um, you, can have, um, you can have blood sugar imbalance that causes you not to make good quality bile, flow, bile products, and this is going to cause more bile flow problems. You can even have things like a poor vagal function that's not allowing good contraction in your gallbladder. You can have things like low hydrochloric acid in your stomach, so you're not dropping the pH properly in the, in the small intestine, and therefore you're not activating. Remember, cholecystokinin activates the gallbladder to contract, but that's all activated by that drop in pH that happens when you have a lot of when you have uh, the proper amount of HCl. So you could have low HCl poor vagal function, insulin resistance, low thyroid, high estrogen relative to progesterone. There's a lot of things that can cause your bile flow 
to get congested. When it gets congested, the liver can get congested. So all of these things can work together, oxidative stress, and so on and so forth. All right. So, uh, you know, and just quite simply, if things are not moving through and getting into that central vein and moving through properly, you know, you're not processing things properly. You just get congested. It gets bloated. It's just not, uh, just not processing things. So that's uh, for passive hepatic congestion. Let's move on. And let me talk about this. These three right here, let me get my white. These three right here are all considered a spectrum, a spectrum of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So if you hear the term not NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we're really talking about a spectrum. The, the, uh, the most damaging or the most detrimental, of course, is cirrhosis. And the one just down from that is NASH, which is this guy. And the one or the beginning stage one you all see is really the uh, fatty liver. So let's look at this. Uh, NAFLD is a spectrum. All right. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a spectrum of liver disease from a bland uh, fatty infiltration to chronic hepatitis, non-alcoholic hepatitis or NASH that can be a result in cirrhosis and organ failure. So there's a spectrum, that's all I wanted you to get there. So watch this, worldwide, there is an epidemic of obesity. This comes from this journal article, an overweight with two thirds of Americans affected. Two thirds, that's 66%, 67%. A strong association exists between excessive body weight and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's the most common thing that's driving it. Obesity is driving it. That's the reason why we're seeing more non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That's also the reason why we're seeing a lot of liver congestion. They both work together. All right, the most common etiology of abnormal liver function test is NAFLD. Here's another study, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease from steatosis, cirrhosis, non-alcoholic steato uh, hepatitis, NASH, the linchpin between steatosis, which is fatty liver, and cirrhosis. So you have on one end, you have fatty liver. On the other end, you have cirrhosis. And NASH is in the middle. It's somewhere in the middle um, of this. And uh, watch this. His middle spectrum of, of NAFLD was barely recognized in 1981. Watch this right here. NAFLD is now present in 17 to 33% of Americans. If you're a chiropractic internist, Right here, if you don't have a good practice, right there. Get really good at this. There's a lot of folks out there that need your help. Oh, my gosh. People are dying to hear your message. People are dying uh, and needing this. And I'm not just saying they're killing over right now. Some of them are. But this is causing tremendous loss of quality of life simply having NAFLD. It's become worldwide distribution, paralyzed the frequency. It parallels. Watch this the frequency of central adiposity, obesity, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes. These are things as a chiropractic internist that is right in your wheelhouse. You can take care of this. You can really help and save a lot of people's lives and as well as just improve the quality of people's lives. All right, so when we look at, as we said, these three right here, these are all non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's a spectrum. All right, so if we look at fatty infiltration, let's just talk about that, define it a little bit. It may cause diffuse or multifocal hypodensity within the liver, so we get fat in it. Okay, so what happens is we can't deal with the fat, so we push it into hepatocytes. So it favors areas around the hepatic veins, fascias, and ligaments, as well as the hepatocytes. Hepatic vessels pass through low-density foci, foci uh, without being displaced or decompressed, and se selective signal dropout um, in the it is uh, phase GRE is diagnostic of the fatty liver. Okay, so um, yeah, so when you get the fatty liver, one of the things that's happening is is the fat just starts sticking all the different places, and uh, not only that, but it also gets uh, engorged in the hepatocytes themselves. I really want to draw a picture here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this. All right, so we're going to talk about insulin resistance. I don't get too far off the trail. You know what I'll do here before I do this? I'm going to ask Dr. Annette 
um, if we have any questions before we move move to this next section. I don't see any questions. Okay, yet. perfect. Okay, very good. Let me just take a look here and um, let me see what we have. Okay, perfect. Well, let's keep on rolling. All right. I hope you guys are having fun. Like I said, we're talking about liver congestion, which how fun is that? But I got to tell you, if you're a geek like me, you love it. I'm telling you, if you learn this stuff, it's really good for your practice and your clinical skills for sure. Let's talk about this. Okay. So we only have about four to five grams of sugar, glucose in our blood. Give you a little context. We have about on average five gallons of blood in our body. And a teaspoon of sugar is all we have in our blood. Now, you know, people are not in danger of this. Most people are. Some people are. Most people are not. But if you go all the way to eight grams in your blood, you can go into a coma. If you go less than two grams in your blood, you can go into a coma, right? Um, certainly, there's been cases of people have eight grams of blood, they didn't go to coma. But you stretch that very far, you can go into a coma. So your body is going to fight like crazy to keep this glucose at a good place, right? So the average meal is about 75 grams of sugar, carbs, glucose, you know, it's all, it's not all the same, but keep it simple, let's say it's the same. You can't go straight from there to there, we know we don't because we have the portal vein, we just discussed that. Well, it goes through the portal vein, the sugar hits the liver. The liver has a massive job. As uh, that blood is, nine millimeters of mercury pressure floating through the sinusoids. Now the hepatocytes are seeing that sugar. Now, it cannot get into the hepatocytes until this happens. On the outside of the hepatocytes, you have between 300 to 500 little receptors. They're called insulin receptors, right? So as soon as sugar comes out, bam, insulin is released. Insulin comes over here and it will land on one of those receptors. And when it does, it opens the gate for the sugar to go in. I know you guys know that, but I gotta show you something that's layered on top of that. When you have breakdown of these receptors, there are genetic components that can cause those to break down easier. If you've eaten a high carb diet for a period of time, um, if you have chronic inflammation in your system, you have a chronic bladder infection, a chronic mouth infection, you're, you're eating gluten and you're sensitive to it, or whatever the case may be, you have chronic inflammation in your system, um, that can also break down these receptors. Or if you have poor diversity in your microbiome, you don't, these receptors don't signal as well either. So there's a lot of, these are just common things that can break down these receptors. When these, break, when these receptors break down, insulin can't land on them as easily. So your body's first response is just to make more insulin. So, and that starts screwing up all the other hormones. Cause once you start raising that insulin or you have insulin spikes that are higher than the physiological norm, that's when you start dropping testosterone. That's when you start dropping progesterone. That's when you start raising cortisol, start raising uh, estrogens and you start causing this hormonal imbalance and all these things happening. Well, what happens is we still have to keep this equation going. We still have to keep four to five grams of sugar. We can't go higher than that. We're trying, that's the sweet spot for the brain and everything else. We want to make sure it's staying straight. So what happens is we just start shunting the glucose because we can't get it into the cell as good. We start having insulin resistance. We start shunting it into the liver as fat. Now that fat can go in, that fat can actually go into uh, the hepatocytes. It can go uh, lodged onto all the different places we just talked about, but that's how we develop. It's a prime, it's, it's, the, it's a primary source of why we develop um, the fatty liver. And so I just want to put that out there. Now, let's look, remember, we're talking about the spectrum right now of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We just talked about fatty liver. Now we're going to talk about NASH. So NASH is a common, often silent liver disease. Silent, why, why do they call it silent? They call it silent because um, a lot of times people have no symptoms, right? It resembles alcoholic liver disease, but occurs in people who drink little or no alcohol. The major feature is fat in the liver among uh, inflammation and damage, right? So most people with NASH feel well or are not aware they have a liver problem. Nevertheless, NASH can be severe and can lead to cirrhosis in which the liver is permanently damaged. Uh, affected individuals may also have elevated blood lipids. Okay, treatment is centered around, this is what I want to get to, 
working towards a healthy lifestyle, including weight reduction, dietary modifications, increased activity, and avoidance of alcohol, da 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 da. These are all the things that we can really shine in in the chiropractic interest work, because we can do this and much more and get very specific on really how to turn these cases around. Okay, so cirrhosis, basically fibrosis, you're just getting scarring. So once you have a fatty liver and then you have oxidative stress, uh, you know, the liver congestion, inflammation, uh, toxic overload, you have all of these things happening, or you have a viral infection, all of these things happening, you start developing scar tissue. And if you can imagine scar tissue in this section, can you imagine what scar tissue would do if it's sitting in here and how that would you know, block you from normal liver metabolism? That's right. We cannot do without good liver metabolism. Uh, signs of portal hypertension. This is uh, uh, when somebody has a uh, diagnostic clue, somebody has cirrhosis. They can develop portal hypertension. That's when they get the varices. They get the esophageal varices. They get ascites, splenomegaly. You can catch that on your exam, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so clinical applications. Here we are at 7.43. I've got about 15 minutes to go, and I want to give you some real chalk full of clinical pearls the best we can here. So from a history, people have poor digestion. You want to think about the liver, right? I've given you some things here. Hormone imbalances. You want to think about the liver. As a matter of fact, somebody has hormone imbalances. The first thing you don't want to do is fill them full of hormones, right? Now, there are need for people having hormones, but that's not the first step. The first step when you have hormone imbalance is you want to get base, the basics right. And one of the basic foundational elements you want to get right is you make sure that liver is healthy. So if somebody's having weight gain, uh, skin problems, a lot of times they'll show up from, from liver issues. Fatigue can be from liver issues. Chemical sensitivities, we talked about that well. Do you do the smell of certain perfumes or clean products give you a headache or make you anxious or irritable? Uh, are you a lightweight when it comes to drinking alcohol? These are chemical sensitivities and they're often found along with having too many toxins in the liver. Cravings, uh, gallbladder problems. I think I'll do a whole webinar on gallbladder. We might do that next time. I think it would be very helpful. Uh, show you what it looks like, what sludge really is, what the stones are, uh, some protocols on really uh, getting that, that hepatobiliary system moving. But anyway, pain in the upper right portion of the abdomen. People complain about that a lot. They'll have that say, I just got pain right there. And they'll have gone to their medical doctor and the medical doctor said, ah, oh, you pulled a muscle, here's a muscle relaxer, right? Uh, then you do an examination there's no muscle there, right? There's now nah, some muscle, but it's not from the muscle. You poke around, uh, the liver's uh, bigger than it should be, and it's swollen. You get right down on that gallbladder area and, and push on it. And they go, ow, because it hurts, because it's inflamed. Now you have an inflamed liver. Okay. So here are uh, some just some diagnostic clues. Um, so, so our rib cage is coming down here like this. Let me get a different uh, color because I want to be able to see this a little better. There's a rib cage. Our liver's going to be right there. Now that liver, if that's the rib cage, the liver should not go below that rib cage. So if you feel the rib cage and you go and you're palpating on the abdominal exam and you go just a little bit lower and you feel that rib, liver out there, then you're going to know that that liver is swollen. Guess what? Now you have a clue. If the liver's swollen, what does that mean? It means it's congested. Now, it might not be from congestive heart failure. It might not be from any other, it might be from that, but it might be functional liver congestion, which means oxidative stress, uh, uh, toxin burden, uh, inflammatory process, you know, infection, different things like that, that's causing a congestion of that flow going through those sinusoids, remember, and that gets congested, and that could cause you to have a, a, a swollen liver. Percussion is also a good thing. We do this, we go thunk, 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 and then you get below the liver, it should feel hollow. You get the, you, you don't get, you get that resonant sound, right? But, but when you're over the liver, you get that dull sound. And so if you're below the rib cage and you're percussing and you hear the, and you feel the dull or hear the dull, you know the liver is swollen. Here are some bland labs that we're going to look at that will tie together uh, with this ALT, AST. ALT is the most common. ALT is the one that is actually 
uh, more directly related to liver function because AST has also found the, the, the kidneys, the heart, the muscles and different places like that, but ALT is exclusively. Now, your AST, when it's normal, your AST is going to be a little bit higher than ALT because it's found in more tissues. Now, when it gets out of range, out of clinical range, we like to see AST, ALT somewhere around 18 to 26 on both of them. So, uh, but uh, if it gets out of clinical range, the key is, is this, we want the ALT to be greater than the AST. When it is, that is a pattern of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, okay? So, by the way, there's one other thing I have to bring up at this point that needs, that we need to talk about, and it's this. Here's the liver, and remember, we talked about that portal vein, and I did that simple drawing where I just draw a few, drew a few liver cells. Watch this. As, remember, nine millimeters mercury. As that blood is flowing through the portal vein and going in the sinusoids, going to the central vein, hepatic vein, in verifying cava to the heart, okay? As it's traveling through here, okay? As it's traveling through here, if you have congestion going through here, then one of the things that will happen is inside these liver cells, you have ALT. You also have AST. So in a normal circumstance, you're going to have a little bit of the ALT that's going to leak out into this blood, and then it's going to go up into the heart and out to circulation, and then we draw your blood in your arm here, and then we see ALT on the blood report, right? So there's always a certain amount supposed to be there. I was just telling you, 18 to 26 is a good place to be, right? However, when this gets congested here, your hepatocytes just simply cannot process things as well, and it will not dump as much of the ALT into the bloodstream. And so many times with liver congestion, you're actually gonna see a low AST. You could actually see a high one as well, but you're most usually going to see a low AST, okay? I said AST, I meant ALT, sorry, ALT. I'm just saying ALT because it's more directly related to the liver. Now, watch this. If you have liver cells, hepatocytes that are inflamed, if you have uh, hepatocytes that are inflamed, then what's happening is they're breaking apart and when they're, they're more of them are breaking apart than, than normal. And when that's happening, you're leaking out more ALT. And then that's the case that goes above 26. And that is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Okay. So back up. When you have low ALT, we think more about liver congestion. We have elevated AST, ALT. We think more about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, I'm not trying to make a diagnosis out of this. What I'm trying to say is these are just patterns that you're going to see because you might actually have somebody with a low ALT and they really might have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Not arguing the point. But remember, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a spectrum, right? On one side, you have a basic fatty liver and on the other side, all the way to cirrhosis, but in between you have NASH, and NASH has not only the components of fatty liver, but it also has that inflammatory component. That inflammatory component is what's driving up, uh, it's the driving up the uh, ALT, right? So you could have only a fatty liver, and in concept, you may not have elevated ALT. It actually might be low. So I'm just saying that you know, put those things together. Don't make hard and fast rules on anything because other things can influence these ALT and AST uh, analytes as well. So we always, when it's out of clinical range, we want the AS, ALT to be greater than the AST. If the AST is greater uh, and you're out of clinical range, then that usually means there's some kind of liver pathology going on there. So you want to check that out and scrutinize it. I'm just going to say just a few of these real quick because we're running short. But alkaline phosphatase, I love to see that between 80, uh, 60 to 80. So here's the gallbladder, liver, and so on and so forth going into here. If that bile flow gets sluggish, we have a problem here. 
uh, sometimes that alkaline phosphatase can raise. There's other things that will raise alkaline phosphatase, but if you have an alkaline phosphatase above 80, one of the things you want to consider is bile sludge or bile flow problems um, and uh, see if it fits the other patterns, remember? Now, I do need to go over one more thing because this is an important when it comes to liver congestion, fatty liver, trying to understand, all right? So the body is made of protein. That's what makes everything go. Inside the cells, that's what makes everything go, all right? So uh, proteins only last so long. They break down, they go to the liver, and your liver reconstitutes them and makes new proteins out of them. But there's a process that has to happen for that to happen. When you break proteins down, they break down into their individual individual amino acids. And so amino acids have a lot of nitrogen in them. That nitrogen, if you if left alone, will bump up against hydrogen and will actually produce as a normal process ammonia. But if you've ever smelled ammonia, you know it's toxic. So ammonia can be toxic, is toxic. It's in the liver, then your liver takes ammonia and converts it to blood urea nitrogen because it's a safer form of nitrogen. Okay, I said all that to get to this. A perfect BUN is going to be 13 to 18 functionally. I'm not talking clinical ranges, I'm talking functional. If you are below 13 and you have a normal uh, protein level, and let me let me say that a little bit differently here. So in other words, a normal protein level would look like 7.1 to 7.5. Sorry about that. So seven, I'm having to do everything with my finger, my pen cut out on me. So anyway, if you have, you know, protein at 6.8, 6.9, 7.2 or whatever, and you're lower than 13, then you have a liver congestion because it's not processing the ammonia well enough. Now, it might not be enough ammonia to build up that give you a problem, but you're not processing it well enough. And therefore, um, it's a sign that your liver is congested. It's not processing things as well. Now, on the other hand, just to clean this up, if you were to have protein down to, let's say, 6.1, right? And then your BUN is 12, you know, 11 or 12. Well, that might make sense because your your the protein amount of protein in your blood is just not high enough and you're not breaking down that much protein. So therefore you're not making that much ammonia and you're, you shouldn't have that much BUN, right? So that's just a, a clinical pearl for you there. Okay. So all these other ratios, uh, your triglyceride to HDL ratio, you want that to be under three. And the reason why is because if it's over three, it's a good indicator of insulin resistance. Uh, LDL to HDL ratio, you really want that under two. If it's uh, above, it's a good sign of insulin resistance. It's not as specific as the triglyceride to HDL, but it's still a good, a good ratio. Uh, your cholesterol to triglyceride ratio should be two to one. If it gets to one to one, that's also an indication of insulin resistance. And guess what? Insulin resistance drives non-alcoholic fat of liver disease and all these other things. I have to get to what are we going to do? Okay, so I'm going to talk about nine foundational things uh, that you can do. Hold on a second. I want to talk about nine foundational liver steps, right? So blood sugar regulation, this is absolute paramount. If you have fatty liver disease, if you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you must, must, must. You know, if you play Monopoly, you don't pass go, you don't collect $200, you go straight there, right? That's what you do. So blood sugar regulation, you have to get that under control. If you don't, it doesn't matter how much milk thistle you give them, how much glutathione, how much glutamine, it's not going to work. You have to get blood sugar under control because that's the main driver of it. So you have to get it under control. Certainly, you know, toxins in the environment, detoxification pathways, other inflammations is important. I'm just trying to put a cap of, an, uh, of emphasis on that. Okay, basic digestion, paying particular attention. You gotta make sure our HCL is good, our digestive enzymes good, our bile flow is good. We don't have constipation and we're not eating foods we're sensitive to. These are just basics. If you wanna help the liver, we have to do these things. Go through that, I've done webinars on that. We teach seminars through the DAPSI program on that. So those are things we're gonna do. Liver loves good proteins, amino acids. So it might not be bad in the beginning stages when you're dealing with somebody with liver congestion to go ahead and use some protein powders, use some amino acid, these kind of things. 
You need to reduce inflammation in the body. If they're eating foods they're sensitive to, they get away from. You have to address infections. Uh, viruses love to go to the liver, by the way, but you could have an infection in your mouth that's just causing chronic inflammatory process that puts stress on the liver. So you need to deal with any infections that you see. Exercise is key. You have to move the body because the blood that doesn't move is not healthy. You got to move your body. Sorry about the poor English. You have to move your body. If you're not going to move your body, you're not going to do as well. Light supper. Now, this is only for people who are not hypoglycemic. If you're hypoglycemic, in other words, you eat food and you get better, you get a lot of energy. Uh, you get angry if you miss food. You get shaky, trembles, jittery if you miss food. You get lightheaded if you miss food. If you have any of those, you probably have hypoglycemia, and this one does not apply to you. You have to take care of hypoglycemia. It trumps this, this move. Light supper with no late night snacking. You want to go to bed slightly hungry. Why? This is probably one of the most overlooked um, processes in liver health, and that's this. The liver does its detoxification by itself at night when you're sleeping primarily. It goes through something called autophagy where it cleans itself and it gets itself ready for the next day. So if you're eating a lot of food right before you go to bed, then what you're doing is you're putting so much food on your stomach and you're getting in your GI tract, your liver's having to deal with that food all night and it has no time to detoxify itself. So you want to train yourself to go to bed slightly hungry, right? It's okay. Don't grab those bag of chips. You don't need them. Just go to bed slightly hungry, and then this will give your liver plenty and ample opportunity to clean itself at night. Oh, let me put an exclamation mark on that because you have to pay attention to that one. All right, diet void of grains, white flour, white sugar, high fructose corn syrup. Right, high fructose corn syrup is especially bad for the liver because fructose is only metabolized in the liver. There's no other or there's no other place in the body to metabolize it. So it's like a laser; it hits right there, and you really have to to uh, you know you, you really have to deal with it in the liver. It becomes toxic, and they started with high fructose corn syrup because it didn't bump your sugar up that much. The problem with it is. The long lasting effect is it makes you more insulin resistant than regular sugar because it puts so much of a tax on the liver. You become liver congested, liver, you know, and all those different things we talked about that drive insulin resistance. Glutathione, milk thistle, and uh, L glutamine, these are reasonable to use, but guess what? Do not, like I said, do not use these unless you've done these other things first. Don't do it, right? You're not going to just have a patient come in and say, oh, you have liver congestion. Uh, I saw a seminar. Let's give you some glutathione. Don't do that, right? You're better than that. Okay, address other health issues. Sometimes people have hypothyroid. Um, you know, some people have congestive heart failure, other things that can cause liver congestion. You have to deal with those issues. Okay, so I want to see if we have any questions there. Yes, there's one. Okay. Um. Hopefully you'll understand what this means. It says, is the AST lowering as well with congestion? What's that? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, it can be. But the reason why I didn't really say that about the AST is because um, I'll just give you an example. If somebody has a real hard workout, you know, they go and they go to the gym, they're, they're lifting weights, and you draw blood on them the next day, they're going to have an AST that's elevated. Um, and it's, it's, and that's the reason why, uh, if you have somebody that's a bodybuilder, uh, and you do their AST, it's going to be elevated and it's not pathological. It's normal because AST is in the muscles. Um, if there's anything going off the heart. So, so there's other things, but ALT is pretty much right there in the liver. So yeah, you could say the same thing about ALT, but maybe not because there could be other things actually, um, uh, that are influencing that. Okay. So. Uh, any other questions before I go on? No. Nope. Okay. So yeah, I mean, there's there. These are the things you want to do. I do. I I did uh, in this process. I had more slides to go through, but I think it's a good place to stop. But I'm gonna. I, I do have a. Um, I do. If you guys want to stick around just a moment, I do have a case study uh, that actually might be helpful for us to look at. Um, and da, 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 here we go. 
right? Let's look at this one. Okay, here's a patient that comes in with diabetes. Okay, so if we look at some of the things, remember the triglyceride to, uh, remember the triglyceride to HDL ratio is a really good marker for insulin resistance. It should be under 3.0. And if you look at that right there, he's actually, that's at least uh, 12, that's 13, right? So that's huge. We know he has insulin resistance. He comes in, he has diabetes. He's, he has uh, glucose at 190. Now look at his enzymes in the liver. Their ALT is higher than AST. So that's safe in the, that it is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I say it's safe. You know, it's a problem, but it means it's not a liver pathology like, um, you know, hep hepatic carcinoma or something like that. So if we look at some of the other uh, numbers, uh, we see, look at this, alkaline phosphatase. Is it 101? Now, I don't know what's going on with his bones, but I would say a very likely scenario is that he has so much insulin resistance that his bile flow is so sluggish and slow that it's actually causing that alkaline phosphatase to elevate. I think that's probably what's going on there, just looking at it. Okay, so uh, da, 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 da. T3 uptake right here. T3 uptake should be 28 to 32. This is a male. When it's 26, it means that his estrogen is too high. He has high estrogen. Now, um, I, just, I, I can't go through that, how, how that mechanism right now, just because of the timing. But um, he has high estrogen. But the reason why it's high estrogen is because testosterone, when it goes to the liver and that liver is, is all messed up with insulin resistance, you will convert your testosterone into whammo, 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 estrogen. Guys that have the big bellies, central obesity, this is an estrogen factory. All right, now look at his ferritin, 484, it's iron storage. He's, you know, he's, he's inflamed. You get that much inflammation, that's what you get. Plan Aquare, we did our blood sugar boot camp. Basically, um, we did a process of everything we talked about here. You know, we had him go on a, a modified paleo. Uh, we had him, um, you know, going through eating a light, you know, supper and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, we gave him a protein powder that had L-glutamine in it. Um, and we use a few basic things like that. And that was pretty much it. And this is, I think, about uh, two and a half, maybe three months later. And if we look, this is just three months later. Now, he was a fresh diabetic, so, that, so these numbers change pretty fast. But if you look at uh, the triglyceride to HDL ratio, instead of 13, now it is sitting at uh, a little over three. So he's still in the insulin resistance, but it's come a long way. So whoops. Um, let's look at this right here. Glucose is down uh, in the pre-diabetic. He's pre-diabetic phase. His, his blood urea nitrogen is actually low. Why is it low? Because his liver is actually congested. Now, why wasn't, it was 14 before, I didn't show you that. Why was it normal before? Well, his liver is congested before, but guess what else? If you have a lot of inflammation in your body, it will drive that BUN up because BUN is carried by proteins. And if you have a lot of inflammation, you're gonna be breaking down a lot of proteins and you're going to have elevated BUN. So, so what's happening is liver congestion was lowering its BUN, inflammation was raising it, so it looked perfect. But now we've got a lot of inflammation off his system. We're just seeing it more for what it is. Uh, protein, that's fine. Where are we at? Okay, so now his ALT was at 80. Now it's at 41. It's not perfect. We'd like to see it down to 26, but it takes time for that liver. It takes time for the liver to heal. The T3 uptake, look at that. That's a big one. It was at 26, means he was making a lot of estrogen. It's now at 29. He's doing much better. He's not converting as much estrogen into uh, a testosterone into estrogen, so he's doing better there. And his ferritin was in 441. It's gone down to 227, just means we've got a lot of inflammation off of his system. So liver congestion wrap uh, uh, Let me do the wrap up, and then we'll do this. Four, four di know your four diagnostic criteria, right? Know what they are. A non-alcoholic fat fatty liver disease is a spectrum. Know the clinical signs. Know the, how to evaluate the labs and the foundational elements. Here's our four diagnostics. You know, know your history, blood labs, and there's our, our nine foundational steps. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back and see, Dr. Annette, if we have any more questions.
Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Oh, please define light dinner. Okay. You don't want to eat. Okay. So you want to eat your biggest meal, you know, breakfast or lunch. And light means you don't want a big meat meal. A light meal is uh, something that's going to be more, uh, 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 more salad, vegetables. And if you do have meat, make it a lean meat, something, you know, say maybe, you know, chicken, fish, uh, but it needs to be light. Now, that doesn't mean every day. If you're out with your friends and you meet them every, you know, once a year and everybody's having a T-bone steak and you want to do that, that's fine. But we're talking about on the average day, right? And you also want to, you know, you also want to leave a 12-hour window between when you uh, have your last bite of food at night until you eat breakfast in the morning. So in other words, if your last bite of food, if you're going to eat breakfast at seven o'clock in the morning, then do your best. Don't eat after seven o'clock at night. You need that 12 hour window. And like I said, light supper just means light supper. Don't eat that much. Right. So and stay away from the heavy meats. OK. Any other questions? Nope, that's it. OK, well, guys, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I did want to let you know that we are having a uh, we're having a DAFSI class this weekend. I think it's on pharmacognancy, if you want to join in on that. And then a month from now, I'm going to be doing a, a DAFSI class, uh, the RALA class. It's also online. Uh, we're going to and it's going to be a wrap up of the first eight modules. It's really cool. It's a workshop. It's full of clinical pearls. You'll want to really join along if you can do that. And uh, um, if you would like to do that, I, I should write down this. Uh, you can call 573-341-8292. And you can ask for my mom is Virginia or ask for Carrie. And either one of them can put you uh, in the right direction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Annette. Thank you. I appreciate you helping. And uh, thank you guys for listening. I hope you got a lot out of this. Thank you.